Today we find ourselves atop Mauna Kea, the highest peak in Hawaii, my home away from home, in the heart of American astronomy. Just keep going, man. Just back up. Oh God, oh God, you're good, you're good. Oh we are PhD comics. And we want to know why. Currently, we are in the car on the way to Mauna Kea, which is the highest mountain on uh, Hawaii. It's also the home of several telescope facilities. Most of the atmosphere is going to be below you when you get to about 13,000 feet, which is the height of Mauna Kea. And so you put telescopes there so that you don't have to look through as much atmosphere when you're trying to look into space. So hopefully we will really get an inside look at what it's like to be an astronomer sitting on top of a mountain, pondering your life. It's a stand up. Ah, uh, Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. Moon clock. I actually do want some of this stuff. Oh my god, they have ramen. That's hilarious. That's a ramen. Wow. This is an accurate life-size depiction. But you notice how tech is, is different? Basically, it's many mirrors, so you can make it really, really big. They can like move all of their mirrors individually, so they can correct for like atmospheric uh, aberrations. Like real time? Like real time. Like so that's jittering. adaptive optics. So are these in the t-shirt, are they placed strategically? If you... <laughs> <laughs> I have the same thought. This is the back of the t-shirt, Jorge. This is the back of the t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> See Jorge showing off the largest of the telescopes on top of Hawaii. <laughs> but then what are these two? <laughs> Visible udders. We're here at uh, about 9,300 feet at the Mauna Kea Visitor Center and we ran into a good friend of mine, a colleague named Phil Muirhead. He is a postdoc at Caltech and he works with John Johnson on uh, ex instrumentation for exoplanets. So why are you down here instead of up at the telescope? Yeah, I got just altitude sickness, so. Describe the symptoms, what are, what are So it's sort of like when you get up really fast and you, you brain, your blood kind of leaves your brain, but constant. So like know? nausea and dizziness? Yeah, the nausea is really the, the problem. So people have different symptoms. I, don't, I didn't really get a headache, so a lot of people get a headache, but I was just like, really nause nauseated. And actually, it wasn't my decision to go down. The, the student and this other researcher, <laughs> they, they said, go lie down for a second. I lay down five minutes later. They came in and they said, you're going down. <laughs> and they took me down. All right, Alex, so we have to wait uh, here for about an hour to, uh, for our bodies to acclimate. What, what should we do? What would North scientists here normally do? Um, well, it's cold and uh, I'm hungry, always. So... <laughs> 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 there are more than a dozen telescopes at the top of Mauna Kea, probing a range of wavelengths from visible light all the way out to radio waves. Each wavelength detects different molecules, and together the different telescopes give us a more complete picture of the sky. But stop before it comes out fully or you'll burn out the camera. Oh yeah, I just What we're looking at when we look at objects that are very far away is we look at their composition. We try to see what they're made of. So for the most part, they're made of different atoms or molecules. All of these molecules, when they interact with their environment, they tend to move. And so if the environment's hot, they take that heat from the environment and they start to do a little dance. When it does that, it spins at a certain frequency, like it'll go around and then around and then around. And every time it does that, it emits light at that frequency. Oh. It's CSO? Yeah. It's, it's a ball. Ball, baby, ball. Just go and burn up. When you go up in altitude, gases expand, and sometimes they expand right out of you. This is the CSO telescope. The Caltech Submillimeter Observatory, as you see, it was built in 1987, if I remember correctly. It has a 10.4 meter dish. 
you point with that dish, which has a field of view of about 20 arc seconds, you point to a source, the light is coming in, and then with the secondary mirror, you just choose in which receiver you want to receive that light, and that receiver has to be tuned to the transition you're observing. Okay. It's actually quite an effort we're doing in cooling as well. These receivers need to be very cold. So we pre-cool them with liquid nitrogen and then we cool them down with liquid helium. Even the cooling alone costs $6,000 in a week. Oh wow, it's fully open. <laughs> yeah. That is awesome. Wow, look at that. What, what does it mean to be an observer? Well, you have to work with instruments, which I like very much. Some telescopes have telescope operators that help you a lot. Some, like the CSO, don't, so you do everything on your own. Especially for the older ones, you have a lot of knobs to turn and buttons to press, and if you do it wrong, you won't see a thing. Also, for, as an observer, you need to be able to switch from day to night schedules quite often. You know, I just got up at 4 p.m. today. I will now work the full night and get to bed tomorrow at 8 then sleep my seven hours till four and it repeats. <laughs> it's the omelette before I go to bed and it's a steak for breakfast, <laughs> exactly. And another thing is we are actually on altitude. I don't know if you feel it, but since I am already here a couple nights, for me, it's okay now. So your body responds to the fact that it has too much CO2 and then you breathe to get more oxygen. But as you go up in altitude, the CO2 actually, the abundance of CO2 drops off faster than the abundance of O2 because it's a heavier molecule. So just due to gravity, it stays closer to the ground. So the higher up you go, the CO2 falls off faster than the, the oxygen. So oxygen is falling off as well, but your body doesn't realize that it doesn't have enough oxygen because it also doesn't have too much CO2. It's all science at the end, is it? Yeah, <laughs> molecules. <laughs> Do you guys feel the whole dome move? Yes, it's like being on a ship. Yeah, but if you don't look outside, you don't feel it. You don't feel it? If you don't look outside, no. Hello, my name is Al and I'm a PhD student at the IFA Manawa and I'm here with Tim Reason to observe Mars tonight. So what you can see here is the UIP, which is the user interface we use to actually command the sluice to point to a source in the sky. Here in the orrery, you kind of see the sun here, which will go down soon. The telescope and its data like where we're pointing. And on the right side, we see actually what the receiver gets. Wow, <laughs> ramen. Astronomer's favorite food. The light comes down from the dish up there in the hole and gets focused here on the secondary mirror down there. And then from there, it reaches one of several receivers. Today, we will use the receiver that you see right here, Barney from the control room. He was loading the line that we want to observe in the computer which creates a signal on a certain frequency. Basically the idea is to make the whole receiver sensitive to the line we want to observe later on. Of course for that we need an artificial line first that we're creating here. So what are you pointing this telescope at tonight? Tonight we will point at Mars and um, later on we will either go to Enceladus which is a moon of Saturn uh, Enceladus is known to have a thorus, which is it's like a donut around it, which has not a solid part like a Saturn ring. It's more a uh, gas and, and just molecules floating around. You're going to learn what molecules are there. That's what we try. We focus on the solar system, its early stages, evolution, and um, explaining maybe the story of water and its relation to life, which is my topic, astrobiology. Some of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn are interesting even for the question of how habitable they could be to extremophile life, you know. This kind of extends our idea of life to places like, let's say, Titan or to places like, like moons of Jupiter and Saturn where there could be water, there could be fluid water even, and maybe some life. So yeah, that's what we do. Even since I was a boy, I knew it had to be the stars or whatever. <laughs> and well, so what do you mean? I was so fascinated by space and the stars, and I think the movie E.T. changed my life. <laughs> so really? I'm still waiting for somebody to come and visit us. As I say, it's not forbidden to have fun while you work and to like what you do. That's why we have the long times up here. We don't mind being at altitude. If things go well, we really cheer up and we have fun. I see that some tourists are coming. I want to check out what they are up to. <laughs> <laughs> Oh!
focus. Rotate, focus. rotate. Ooh, kinetic energy, translation of motion. Ah. <laughs> what are you feeling, Alex? I'm feeling my heart right now. <laughs> Inside my chest. It's invigorating. It's a little bit chilly, but um, telescopes in the background, and this is my haven. This is this is my why. This is why I do it. Because nothing beats being up here, being so much closer to the heavens, to the stars, to the sources that I'm interested in, to just the unimaginable and unimaginable scales and incredible sources. And I am fortunate enough to get to work up here. Yeah, this is my why. Ha, ha, ha.